I see so many friends. Hey everybody, Peter Maravellis here. Hope this finds you all safe and well. Tonight on City Lights Live, we are thrilled to have back in the house our dearly beloved Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz celebrating the release of a new book. It is titled, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. It is published by our friends over at Beacon Press. City Lights Live is the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-star calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, where for, we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the fall season. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is no stranger to City Lights. We've both published her books and also featured her in events at the store. She is a scholar and lifelong activist with an involvement in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. She is the winner of the 2017 Land and Cultural Freedom Prize and is the author of numerous books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which is the recipient of the 2015 American Book Award. City Lights uh, recently published a book, Loaded, A Disarmament History of the Second Amendment. She makes her home in San Francisco. And joining her tonight in conversation is another friend of City Lights. We are delighted to have with us the former poet laureate of San Francisco, Alejandro Murguia. Alejandro Murguia is the author of numerous books, which include The Southern Front and This War Called Love, uh, published by City Lights, and they're both winners of the American Book Award. Uh, his nonfiction book, The Medicine of Memory, highlights the Mission District in the 70s during the Nicaraguan Solidarity Movement. He is a founding member and the first director of the Mission Cultural Center, and he was a founder of the Roque Dalton Cultural Brigade and co-editor of that wonderful anthology, Volcan, Poetry from Central America, also published by City Lights. Currently, he is professor in Latinx studies at San Francisco State University. He is the sixth San Francisco Poet Laureate and the first Latino poet to hold that position. So before we begin, I would like to remind you all, we're we'll posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase books. We'll also be hosting the Q&A at the end of the discussion, so please do post your comments and questions in the same location. So please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and Alejandro Murguia. Welcome to City Lights Live. Great, thank, th thank you, thank you, Peter, uh, for that introduction, and welcome everyone to this uh, most fascinating and interesting evening that I think will shed light on a lot of issues that are currently. Uh, on our minds, perhaps. And uh, of course, I want to welcome Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, our guest artist today, and congratulate her on the publication of this really quite fascinating uh, book. I've had a chance to take a peek at it. And it, like I said, it raises a lot of interesting questions. So I want to start by asking uh, Roxanne, so why, why not? A, the title of the book, Not a Nation of Immigrants. What inspired your, your, your desire to investigate that, that subject? Yeah, it kind of, you know, it, it goes back to um, my activist and scholarly work um, with uh, North American Native uh, people in particular. Um, and um, Native scholars started oh, in the 1990s uh, analyzing, you know, what kind of colonialism um, the United States, which doesn't call itself a colonial uh, nation state uh, colonizer, they think they were colonized by the British, but actually they were just, uh, British citizens, you know, um, who wanted their own empire. So there's a difference. <laughs> so settler colonialism is, you know, it's not new. It's it's always been known as a one of the uh, the main type of colonialism is a um, a middle a middleman like the Raj um, in India that that plays the role in between the colonized and the colonizer. So basically administrators um, go to the colonies. Uh, so it's very easy to sort of kick them all out 
because there aren't that many of them, they don't really settle and you know raise their families for generations like South Africa or New Zealand or Australia, Argentina, Uruguay, and the United States and Canada. So settler colonialism is um, um, really how the US nation state was founded and immigration really started with the uh, nearly 2 million Irish starving refugees in the 1840s. Up until then, everyone who came, came to, a, to create a polity, to create the United States. And, you know, from the very beginning, from 1607. But when the Irish famine um, people came, they, um, it was already created. It was pretty much set in stone. Mm -hmm. uh, they were reaching the Pacific, you know, in 1848, taking half of Mexico and sort of uh, completing that uh, vision that they had on independence was to reach the Pacific and come to dominate the Pacific and, you know, Chinese trade. So your argument, in a way, <clears throat> is that it's not really a nation of, of immigrants, but of sort of an economic expansionist class that uh, later on actually turns against immigrants. Well, it turns against immigrants, but it, you know, they, they built this industrial powerhouse, um, first of all, in the Cotton Kingdom. That didn't really require, because slavery was legal, enslaved Africans, they had this, you know, unpaid labor force and they kept importing and reproducing slaves. So they didn't have a labor issue. Uh, but when they, you know, after um, the Civil War, when they really started building the industrial Northeast, um, they needed huge uh, amounts of, of labor and also for building the railroads. Uh, so this is when immigration, the first immigration law ever passed or ever mentioned, you know, immigration was 1883. And that was to exclude Chinese who at the same time, the builders of the railroad were actively recruiting and bringing but they were contingent, you know, they didn't have citizenship status, they weren't settlers, so they were, you know, horribly treated and, and um, exploited. Um, so that, you know, that uh, was the beginning of, of, of immigration or exclusion, what we call basically exclusion. Uh, US, US immigration has always been based on exclusion. But they did develop ways to Americanize. Um, uh, some have called it like no native historian, how the Irish became white, how they became white, started acting like white people, like white settlers. But it's really how they become settlers, the Americanization process. So I go through that, you know, in the um, chapter seven on um, uh, which I call Columbus, you know, basically. Uh, they have something for everyone, you know, for the Italian immigrants, they give them Columbus uh, as their ancestor. So he was first founder, even though he didn't land in the yeah. continent. So, so another character, historical character that you do a really good job of kind of recasting his true history is someone that's been in the news kind of lately, and I'm talking about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so, so what's up with Alexander Hamilton? <laughs> yeah, that's the first chapter of the book. It's basically about the founding of the United States and his very important role. Um, he was, you know, he's always portrayed as kind of a businessman and he did, you know, he owned slaves. He, he did slave trading. He married into one of the largest slave owning families, um, certainly the largest in New York, the Schuyler family. Um, so he, he did that, he was a businessman, but he was also, a, he was basically military. He was Washington's right-hand man. He was a general, he led armies. Um, so 
there's a really a military, a militaristic content of the Constitution that very rarely gets read. But fortunately, there's a, this historian law professor at Stanford, Greg Abraski, who um, who did you know has analyzed that. So I use his very lucky to have had his work because I wouldn't have understood that uh, much, you know, that this this concept of the fiscal military state, which the United States is, uh, it's a, a state made for war. And it makes sense, you know, not only this endless wars that we talk about now, but there's never been a day in US history without war, never a day. No one's been able to show me that day if there was one. But most of those were uh, in the 19th century were against uh, Native Americans and Mexicans. <laughs> so they don't count, uh, <laughs> you know, apparently. And, and, and uh, part of your book and obviously deals with the question of Mexico and, and that whole status, but especially about the border, right? Which uh, for me, and I think for a lot of people has always been a, a zone of, on one, in one sense, of conflict, but then in the in another sense, well, migration north and south and south and north has been part of the human DNA uh, on this hemisphere since there's been humans, right? So I know you have your own sort of uh, insight and perspective on the question of Mexico and the border. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about in the book regarding that. Well. I might take this opportunity, if it's okay, to uh, read a, um, an excerpt from that chapter. Um, it's chapter eight, the border. It's just you know just a short um, short bit that sort of you know maybe sets the stage for discussing about it. So Donald Trump began his bid for the presidency in July 2015 by criminalizing Mexicans who attempt to migrate to the United States. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, which he repeated and expanded upon for the following 16 months of stadium rallies, promising to build a wall across the entire border and answered by chance of build that wall. However, the steady stream of undocumented families with children as well as unaccompanied children crowded at the border crossing seeking asylum were not Mexican citizens, rather desperate families and children from Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala. Refugees from dysfunctional governments, drug gang violence, and lack of employment, people running north for their lives and the lives of their children. They were refugees from the chaos and wreckage of the violent 1980s US counterinsurgency wars and coups in their countries to destroy democratic left movements that were supported by majorities of those populations. But indeed, the refugees, mostly poor mestizos from El Salvador and Honduras, along with large numbers of Mayans from the Guatemalan highlands, were at the U.S.-Mexico border, a surge that began en masse in 2014 during the Obama administration. A Fox News host tapping into the U.S.-Mexican hating erroneously said that the asylum seekers were from, quote, three Mexican countries. <laughs> so in the years leading up to Trump's campaign, the Mexican immigrant population in the United States shrank by 300,000. By 2016, many more Mexicans in the US had returned to Mexico than the numbers entering the United States while detentions of undocumented Mexicans were at a 40 year low. Mexico was no longer the top origin country among the most recent immigrants to the US. 
Thanks to his Mexican-hating top aide, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump was aware of the power of historical Mexican-hating for uh, attracting and building white nationalist base. Miller grew up in the 1990s in the affluent white west side of Santa Monica, an oceanside enclave in Los Angeles County in the larger Los Angeles area. People of Mexican heritage number three and a half million out of nine million population in Los Angeles. During Miller's high school years, the Chicano Youth Organization, Mecha, had an active presence and he began nourishing a hatred for Mexicans and found mentors to educate him in white nationalist politics. At Trump's stadium rallies, Miller's ideology reverberated as Trump conjured an invasion of animals, raving about the dangers of the Salvadoran MS-13 gang, whose members, none of whom are Mexican, comprise only 1% of all gang members in the entire United States. On Sunday, August 3rd, 2019, Patrick Crucius, a 21-year-old resident of suburban Dallas, Texas, drove 634 miles to the Walmart Supercenter in El Paso. And with a Wasser 10 rifle, a civilian version of AK-47, shot and killed 22 people and injured 23 more, targeting Mexicans. Eight Mexican citizens were among the dead, while most of the others who were dead or injured were US citizens of Mexican descent. The self-identified Mexican-hating murderer wrote a manifesto that he posted on a white nationalist website more than an hour before he started shooting. The four-page manifesto is titled The Inconvenient Truth apparently referencing Al Gore's 2007 book and subsequent documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, which warned of catastrophic climate change. So under the cover of being concerned about the environment, blaming what he called Hispanic immigrants for polluting and causing overpopulation in the US, he revealed his true motive, writing, this attack is a response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas. They are the instigators, not me. I am simply defending my country from cultural and ethnic replacement brought on by an invasion. This is what white nationalists claim to be a program of white genocide. When US Americans talk with fear or hate about Latinos, Hispanics, or that there are too many of them, they are usually talking about Mexican Americans, not Cuban Americans or Argentine Americans. Importantly, unlike other Latin American nations, there is a 2000 mile border between the United States and Mexico. And there is an ancient connection between Mexico and the Southeast and Southwest of what is now the United States. With migrations back and forth, roads and trade. The large indigenous agrarian civilizations of what is now the United States in the Southeast and Southwest originated in central Mexico centuries before European invasions. In the Cherokee, Muscogee, and Pueblan migrations north, they carried the sacred corn food and the green corn dance with them. The people who became the Nahuatl speaking Mexica, Aztecs, ultimately ruling central Mexico migrated from what is now the US Southwest. While their relatives who did not migrate, the Hopi people, still reside in the original homeland. The Nahuatl language of the Mexica people was widespread in New Mexico when the Spanish over several decades explored it 
then invaded and occupied it in 1598. Those centuries of migrations and exchanges prior to European colonization live in the memories and stories of the indigenous peoples north and south who were cut off from one another with Spanish, then British and US colonialisms. Although not enunciated by the Mexican haters in the US, this affinity of North and South threatens the legitimacy of settler colonialism and the artificial border that the United States established and militarized, but cannot control. Mexican hating is a form of Indian hating. So <clears throat> very powerful uh, with that, uh, Roxanne. There's, there's also, I guess, other questions that come to mind in particular, uh, not so much the future because we can't predict it, but what about the present, right? I, I know, again, your question, the title of your book is not a nation of immigrants, right? Which, as I mentioned earlier, you kind of dismantle that myth that uh, we're this welcoming, uh, inclusive nation, uh, but perhaps that's not the case. And we've seen it more recently, not just with uh, Donald Trump and Miller and all those uh, xenophobic uh, people, but even inadvertently perhaps with the Biden administration, or if I may raise the issue of Kamala Harris uh, talking to Central American diplomats and literally uttering the phrase, do not come, right? Uh, I'm sure it's like a title for a, your next book, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I could have used that title had I, <laughs> I couldn't have imagined it though. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's every administration, you know, um, Obama was called deporter in chief. Right, right. Uh, and uh, he deported more people than Trump or, you know, Bush or um, I think than anyone ever has, maybe everyone put together. <laughs> so, so what do you attribute the schizophrenia to? This, as you mentioned several times in your book and you just quoted Obama, but many, uh, John F. Kennedy quote, quote all these uh, presidents and politicians and it's become a, a standardized trope of the United States, right? We are a nation of immigrants, right? But, but what, what sort of lays that more as a propaganda as opposed to something really concrete and specific. Yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, it has a lot to do for one thing with, um, with uh, um, the long, long centuries of, um, of uh, African slavery of having uh, disposable labor, literally disposable labor, um, and then importing uh, workers um, many of them starving, some of them being oppressed in, by pogroms and all from Eastern Europe and Italy. And then the contingency of, um, of Chinese workers that um, is, is, is uh, you know, the, I think, I, I would say the United States was founded as the first capitalist state, the first capitalist nation state founded as such and embedded in the constitution. So we know, I mean, it's getting worse and worse and it's so obvious now that the um, labor is the, the race to the bottom, you know, for cheap labor has a lot to do with the demonization of immigrants because yes. they're recruited, you know, and then they're made contingent like all the silicone, you know, near us. Most of the, the most of them are on you know uh, visas. They could be kicked out. They were they were yeah. deported. The Muslims during uh, you yeah. know, when when Trump was deporting Muslims, and yeah. 
you know, they're, they're very necessary now in the technological world, but they're, they're very contingent. So it creates a large, even a majority population that is, um, has to be obedient in some ways and accept whatever is given to them because often they come from countries where they, you know, it's violence or poverty. They're usually sending, I think in, uh, I have the statistics in the conclusion, but I was really shocked to know that um, the remittances, I knew about remittances to Mexico, of course, that's very important to the Philippines, but all of Africa, that the remittances from the United States of the African immigrants to the United States, you know, not black people descended from slavery, but immigrants is, is uh, much more than the uh, GDP, you know, uh, uh, of those countries. So they're totally dependent and that makes them contingent too, because it's not just them individuals, but whole extended families. So well, it, it makes for a very weak population of really expressing, you know, when, when they kept saying, oh, Latinos started voting for Trump. Well, I think they try to maneuver however they can, you know, contingent people to be safe and for their families to be safe. Well, for some countries like take Haiti, for instance, where the average salary before the earthquake was $90 a month, uh, an, an immigrant sending a hundred dollars a month or fifty dollars a month to Haiti is like right. pra practically doubling the income uh, of that country. But also bringing up Haiti, notice that we have, and I'm, I know you're aware of, different immigration policies, right? If you're a Cuban, well, then you're welcome. But if you're a Haitian, then you got to go back. Right, and if you're a Salvadorian, you get thrown in a concentration camp, right? But again, if you're a Cuban, you get financial aid, you get assistance in getting housing, and perhaps getting a business started. You're treated in a completely different uh, manner. So even that question of immigration or migration or asylum is problematic, how we approach it. Yeah, it's totally, you, you remember the, in Central America, uh, the the interventions in Central America, how how they welcomed any uh, you know, they were fighting the Contra War, so they welcomed any immigrants, you know, any asylum seekers from Nicaragua because that made Nicaragua look bad. Right. But it wouldn't allow any Salvadorans and Hondurans and um, Guatemalans who were. Um, suffering genocide in, in Guatemala would not allow them in, you know, because they were friendly governments to the United States. So, so ultimately, perhaps from your perspective, having just intensely researched this topic, right? And a topic that's gonna to be on the table for a long, long time and a, an issue in coming elections, right? Uh, I get it for perhaps, the foreseeable future, and, and perhaps from an altruistic or humanistic point of view, without being too altruistic, but somewhat practical, what is the solution to a complex question like immigration, and of course, wrapped up with, with it, the question of asylum, right? And also the burdens placed on the home countries, right? Like you see perhaps in uh, Turkey or Greece, right? Uh, where humanitarian crises are caused by these flood of refugees and the refugee floods are caused by wars or destabilization of these countries economically, politically, or militarily. So what is gonna be the solution for a country like the United States that is kind of like the funnel where everyone wants to come? Yeah, they, they make... Um... You know, wars in all these places that creates refugees, you know, like the Syrian refugees, the Yemen refugees. And, and then the <clears throat> United States has like 36,000 asylum seekers a year. That's their cap. Whereas Iran has about 2 million Afghan refugees from US war there that they're supporting. 
even, you know, they're in Pakistan, they're in Iran, in the, in the neighboring countries. So, so the, you know, we, the people of the United States, allow ourselves not to be aware <laughs> of any of these sort of ugly things that we might be able to do something about, you know, if we put our minds to it. There's, you know, uh, I think there's never really been an anti-war movement in the United States. Some things claim to be anti-war. There was an anti-Vietnam war. One, you know, a war. But it was very clear afterwards that that didn't mean, you know, don't do covert invasions of Central America <clears throat> or, or what they were doing in Afghanistan in the 1980s. You know, it didn't just start. <laughs> so that's the, you know, immigration and asylum seeking, almost everyone who wants to come to the United States, it's economic. You know, it's not, I don't, I don't think it is really, oh, because it's such a great place. You know, it is it is a place where you can um, be free to sleep under a bridge. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that you can be free of political persecution unless you're, you know, politically inclined, if you stay apolitical and stay out of things. But I thought, you know, I, um, I thought I would mention uh, for people who don't know that where this nation of immigrants comes from in the first place as a mythology, I thought it was something that went way back that people just said a saying, but it actually was created in 1958. It was created by John F. Kennedy, notably the first um, child of immigrants to run for the presidency, also the first Catholic. So it was, I think, partially a piece of propaganda to support his upcoming presidential campaign. He was a senator at the time he wrote it. Uh, it's a book, he published a book. It's a bestseller, it's always been a bestseller. There are about 40 different, you know, revisions of it with different introductions. You can look on Amazon and choose your year that you, <laughs> or whoever introduces it. So it really is a piece of propaganda. Of, and, and fairly of, recent, uh, and yeah. fairly recent on top of that. 1958, yeah. Yeah, wow. So I actually, when I, I was raving against, um, mm -hmm. uh, the term nation of immigrants. In 2005, I wrote a, uh, I call it a rant, but monthly review called it a blog, uh, in which I said, this is not, stop saying this is a nation of immigrants. But I had no idea that it was invented by John F. Kennedy. Uh, it was just, you know, that it, 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 um, it covers up settler colonialism. You know, it makes it look like it's just this big, bountiful country that most immigrants who've come since the Irish refugees have not come to take land. You know, that's a, a distinct difference between settlers and immigrants is land. So they come for jobs generally, you know, they come for jobs or to start a business but usually in urban areas. And even if in towns, they don't, you know, they don't come to be ranchers and, you know, uh, make a bunch of land. And you touch upon that in, in your text, in your book, right? And although I think most of us kind of grew up knowing that there was, okay, the United States expanded, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think you put a, a, a more realistic and sometimes almost brutal touch to how uh, aggressive and violent and genocidal this uh, quest for land and expansionism, which wasn't, as you point out, not, not immigrant based at all, but settler capitalist, the fiscal military state, which is a nice phrase, right? I think perhaps even better than the industrial military because it's all about money, right? Yeah, yeah it's about money. It's a it's a, a capitalist state and 
it's interesting because it, you know, that makes it almost like a, a giant corporation. Yeah. Sort of handing out to smaller corporations. I mean, you would certainly have to have, say Exxon's a small corporation compared to the U United States government, <laughs> uh, but it operates <clears throat> almost, almost like a, was formed and operates almost like a corporation. So you keep trying to get democracy out of that, you know, but yeah. I don't think it has hardly anything to do with democracy or even republicanism, you know, I mean, in the old, you know, in the political science sense, not in terms of Republican Party. Um, so I, it's a, it's so distant from, and the money involved in, um, you know, getting elected to office and so forth. So I think at the, at the urban level, sometimes cities, sometimes, you know, um, can create a form of democracy. We seem to have a little bit more of it here in San Francisco than, uh, you know, well, I, come, I come from Oklahoma, there's almost no democracy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. So uh, get, give us your, your final uh, or an impression about what did, you, what did you as a writer take away from doing this research? And, and working on this. And, and how long did it take you, by the way, to? Well, it was interesting because I, I had had the contract for the book for three years and I was traveling a lot, um, still with my indigenous people's history of the United States, still uh, giving a lot of talks around the country. And I enjoyed that, you know, because I'm retired from teaching and a lot of it was university students, you know, and um, without having to grade papers or anything, I got to do the fun stuff uh, of, of teaching. And of course, then, you know, we're all shut down uh, in uh, March 17th, <laughs> 2020. And after about a month of, you know, um, doing all the things we did that first month, trying to figure out what to do, being all isolated and everything, uh, I said, oh, I have a book contract. I better get to work on this book. You know, I have no excuse now. So basically I wrote it uh, between May and December last year. I worked eight hours a day, six days a week. I always took Sundays off. That's good. <laughs> read the Sunday paper and, you know, and rest. But I, I was totally, it, it, it kept me sane, I think, because that was a really, you know, leading up to the election and then the, you know, the Trump not leaving. And, you know, I was able to kind of tune all that out because there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> and, uh, but it did have a big effect on me in that um, I did uh, do, I had done quite a bit of research already. You know, I had set it up, the whole thing, what I was going to, I knew exactly what I was going to write. I had the chapters outlined. But I was, one thing that really amazed me was how much research material is accessible online now. I've always oh. gone to the library, you know, and, and, and done work, but I, I was just really impressed with 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 that, you know, that I could actually find in most cases, I could find something I needed. So I found a lot of really great literature. It's still coming out, you know, on uh, on uh, immigration and um, uh, also the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests across the country were taking place. The statues coming down. So I would, these things I was it, were working into my um, narrative, you know, because I had ended up doing a whole chapter on Columbus and, um, a, and it did affect it. But I think the other thing um, that really, um, really uh, made, made a difference in how I constructed the book, you know, I, I probably would have dealt with um, uh, Chinese immigration, if you can call it immigration even, um, very differently had it not been for the um, attacks on Chinese 
taking place on all Asians, because you know people in the U.S. can't tell the difference between yeah. a Chinese and a Thai and a Vietnamese or Jap Japanese, but it was directed at Chinese. And that Wuhan, you know, Trump inspired the Wuhan flu. Um, so I ended up the longest chapter in the book is on um, on Chinese exclusion, and I it's called Yellow Peril. You know, so I go back, it goes back to Marco Polo. Oh. It is so deep in the West, the mistrust for China. Mm. So, and, and you see this Chinese bashing, even on the left, you know, China's going to take over, you know, they're building these roads, you know, so they can get the military. That's exactly the language of Marco Polo in the 12th century. These people are well organized. If, if they could form army armies and come and take over Europe, it's the same <laughs> language as the twelfth century. So that was probably the most important, you know, original discovery I made, and it really, it really had to do with what was happening: the attacks on Chinese. I mean, and you know, we live here in San Francisco. Our population is fifty percent Chinese. My name, I live in New Chinatown. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I I don't see this. You know, even though some of these incidents did happen in San Francisco, I feel very comfortable living. You know, right. with the best neighbors I've ever had are you know Chinese neighbors. Mm -hmm. So I think I hadn't thought deeply enough, you know, when I started the book, but as I got into that research, that was really profound to me to find the long roots of that and how difficult it is going to be to deal with it. And so we could see war with China. The U.S. has warships in the South China Sea pointed at China. Yeah. Uh... And uh, <clears throat> I was <laughs> going to add something about. Uh, so, uh, in in one way, this question is ancient, and yet it's uh, present and it's future. It uh, involves a lot about the identity of the United States, and uh, and the constant changing face of the United States, because recent statistics though they often lie, show that more and more people are multiracial and yeah. claim many identity or many ethnicities in that sense, right? So maybe if we are ever going to truly be a nation of immigrants in that sense, it'll be from those future generations that are in fact yeah. multinational or international in a way, which, which would sort of uh, confirm the fear of the white nationalists that that would happen. Exactly. Yeah, I find it, you know, just, um, of course I've had generations of students teaching and then talking to, you know, traveling and talking and and then this new, watching this new, you know, young generation protesting last year, it gives me hope in the future. I find when I don't go out uh, talking and interacting with young people, I tend to get more and more pessimistic. And that was one of the, that was a lovely thing about the Black Lives Matter uh, led protests is that I could know that was going on. You know, it, it gave me hope um, because yes, they're multinational. They accept each other. They, they know all their roots. You know, it's not like they become um, uh, homogenized. They say, yes, I, I, you know, I'm black and I'm uh, Nigerian and I'm, right you know, Italian, Mexican, and Italian, right. you know, right. <laughs> and, and they, you know, they, um, uh, but they, they also have relations with each other that I think we almost couldn't in our generation imagine. Yes. I mean, uh, I first experienced it in Nicaragua, the, you know, the Santa Anita revolution, that kind of warmth and, you know, friendship and, community, but they seem to have it, you know? Yes. And uh, a lot of it comes from those cultures that they're, they're made of, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, 
a time maybe to uh, bring on some questions from uh, 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 comments from uh, where's Peter? There's yeah. Peter. So uh, wow. yeah, we've got quite a bit here. Um, I don't know how many we're going to be able to get around to, but it's, it's uh, a very engaged audience tonight. So uh, Daphne asks, could you share your thoughts in developing an internationalist revolutionary analysis with an emphasis on centering indigenous nations? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that um, it's, uh, I, I can't speak for, you know, every uh, 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 country where, you know, indigenous peoples are, certainly we see it in, in very importantly in, in Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, um, but in the United States um, and Canada, I do believe, especially, well, let's talk about the United States, that Native people, not every single one, but in general, Native people who, who know their own history, have been brought up in their own culture and, and know that oral history of, of their experience with the United States, um, they're the only people who know the true history of the United States. Descendants of enslaved Africans know like a, a, a 90%, you know, a really important segment of it. Um, time, you know, in time uh, and, and in, in the economy, but the, in terms of taking conquest and taking the continent, this was a hundred years war that uh, started with the revolution itself and uh, where they were fighting mostly native peoples, you know, that they, they were, and moving with the Northwest ordinance, laying out how to, uh, how to conquer the continent, starting with what they called the Northwest territory, that area beyond the Appalachians, the Ohio Valley became five different states, those Midwestern states. Um, and then to go on. So they had this vision and they carried it out methodically in this Hundred Years' War that basically ended symbolically um, with the 1890 massacre of the Wounded Knee refugees trying to turn themselves into the government um, unarmed. And uh, that was, you know, the signal of, of the end of armed resistance by native peoples when they were then put in reservation. So I do believe, and I, of course I know I taught in Native American studies and I, um, I know uh, I, I have my doctorate in history, but I decided at a, uh, probably right after Wounded Knee decided that I would, I understood you know, that you can't really understand the United States without understanding uh, the experience of Native people. So I do believe in the United States in particular, even though Native people are a tiny minority, uh, they have a significant land base that can be expanded. Uh, for instance, to be um, all of the national um, the national forests, the um, everything that Deb Holland is now in charge of <laughs> in the Department of Interior was land taken by the federal government without treaties from and should be restored to the appropriate native nation. And um, the national, including the national parks, which were the are, were the most sacred places for Native people. Why wouldn't they be Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, now tourist sites? So um, this idea of, you know, land back is, um, is very important because I think mostly people who think about changing the United States, uh, you know, progressive people want, you know, more democracy and more that, um, is mostly urban, urban people, and they don't understand the importance of the land that even today, 
you know, George Washington, the real estate man. Even today, real estate is still the main uh, basic um, uh, commodity. Uh, we could see that in 2007, 2008, that was a crash of the real estate market. So land is central to the United States. And so very, very few historians, scholars, activists I know outside of native scholars, activists, and just ordinary people um, know that, you know, and that knowledge is um, so important to spread, you know, and um, native scholars have done, there's a really a large body of literature now. When I wrote an indigenous people's history of the United States, there was a lot. I couldn't have written that book in the year 2000 because these are, you know, there, in 1970, there were three Native Americans with PhDs, three. Now there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands. And that makes a difference. So they are, you know, um, Phil Deloria is at uh, Harvard teaching history now. So the, 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 they're having an effect. Um, so I think it's very important, you know, that to understand that to have real change in the United States, real um, change that is also necessary if we're going to, the um, hum humanity is going to even survive or if living mammals of any kind are going to survive the climate catastrophe that the that it's really important that um, people acknowledge and recognize and listen to follow this native leadership you know that, that has developed so i have a a comment from an a how would you address kim talbert's claim that creating these identity political movements even if indigenous is just creating a new property for a group of new bourgeois to use against the larger whole of the working class. Yeah, you know, the I think there's confusion about um, identity, you know, with so-called identity politics that um, uh, I think what Kim Talbert is, you know, her, her main point is that native people are, are nations, you know, they're polities. Uh, societies that go back with different languages, different practices, different histories. Um, they come together under colonialism, you know, in, in fighting it, but uh, they remain, uh, you know, com communities of that are uh, political, uh, economic communities. They're, they're, they're nations, you know, they're nations. So, that, you know, the, so identity, I mean, of course, Mexicans are nations. I have a problem with sort of the, the dilution of, um, of the Mexican presence uh, and, and country and, you know, half of it being taken by the United States uh, being, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, homogenized as Hispanic or Latino, uh, as I, you know, as I had uh, said in the reading. Um, so, but I do think that um, African-American um, identity or as descendants, you know, descendants of, uh, of enslaved people have a particular um, a, a particularity that goes beyond uh, just skin color, being black, because that's a, a, a intergenerational trauma. It's not the same as a, a, a black, uh, an African immigrant or even Haitian, as poor as Haitians are, they have the confidence, you know, that they, they made the first actual revolution in the world, people's revolution, um, uh, decolonization, you know,
know, um, in the um, early 19th century. So as, as, as much as the United States tries to destroy, <laughs> destroy Haiti and destroy anything, you know, inspirational that comes from that, there's a self-confidence in Haitians. And even, you know, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, they have their own state. But um, descendants of, of uh, enslaved Africans in the United States do not have their own state. And I think this is a, a particular issue that is, is sort of, you know, and I think that's what Tim Colbert is talking about, is just kind of reduced to color, you know, color lines. And um, that isn't, you know, that, that isn't very productive for actually bringing about change, even though I think African Americans try constantly to make the point, you know, but, but how it, that's too much to handle for a lot of people, you know, is to have, deal with that, um, that historical reality. Uh, I think, you know, in the United States being as it is a corporation that um, people tend to incorporate themselves, you know, rather than, you know, even call it communities, but sometimes they're pretty artificial. And um, I'm not sure that's a root problem, but, a, you know, a manifestation of deeper issues we have to deal with. I think we have time maybe for one more. Logan comments, it seems that the myth of quote unquote nation of immigrants is primarily about quote, becoming white, as you also mentioned. How do people of color eventually uh, become included or not in the myth? Uh, they are particularly thinking about how some multiculturalist approaches to history push the narrative of immigration. Yeah. Um, you know, the, it was really interesting with, um, when the civil rights movement became cool, you know, but especially with black power, uh, in the, but in the fifties and sixties, suddenly all these immigrant groups that had tried so hard, uh, to Americanize and, you know, not to, um, uh, be hyphenated people were hyphenating themselves. They, they tried so hard to become white and then suddenly they wanted to reclaim, you know, their ethnicity so as not to be white, it became uncool to be white. <laughs> so um, that, that was one thing, but I think that, that um, I, I really, I, I think that the, the amount of effort that went in, especially by Theodore Roosevelt uh, before, during, and after his presidency in Americanizing, he was a terrible racist. He thought only, only Anglo-Saxons and uh, Nordic people, uh, Germanic. Um, he didn't even think Scots were, you know, purebred. I mean, he, he was a he was a eugenicist, you know, he was really into eugen uh, eugenics. And he had everyone typed at the very bottom, the most hated is the, uh, the Indian, the, the Native American, that's the worst. And uh, of course, black people were, you know, off the charts as well. But they really had problems when these very dark Italians, because they mostly came from, uh, uh, from Sicily and Southern Europe, the people are darker. Uh, and there was horrible racism against them, but how to Americanize them. So this is when the whole Columbus myth, you know, was, uh, it turned out it was the 400 year anniversary of Columbus in 1892. So uh, identifying Italianness with, uh, when most of these Italian immigrants came, uh, they came from, you know, districts, Ital Italian nationalism really hadn't developed that much yet. And, um, but they, 
they were, uh, and many of them came and went back. I mean, they came to make money to then go buy a piece of land or something back home. Uh, but, but really working on them between the Catholic Church, it also reformed the Catholic Church. Um, is very peculiar in the world um, with this America. They're with the Knights of Columbus, which is founded by Irish Catholics. But uh, it was mainly then picked up by, um, by um, uh, Italian immigrants. So, um, so yeah, the... Um, well, let, 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 me, let me add something uh, to that, Roxanne. Yes, <clears throat> uh, in part to that question uh, the gentleman asked, right? And I think before, and it's correct that before the process of assimilation was that you became Anglo, you became white. But nowadays, I think the process of assimilation is going the other way, right? So for example, uh, the, the, prolifer the proliferation of ethnic food, for example, right? You, you didn't find that 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, right? Or even how little words of, uh, creep into our everyday language, right? Uh, from Japanese or from uh, Spanish, especially, right? So that the United States, if this hope from my perspective is that the United States is becoming more multicultural anyway. So the best thing is to embrace that multiculturalism so that everybody speaks a little bit of Spanish and maybe a little bit of an Asian language and maybe a little bit of Italian. And we all become more internationalist in, the, in that sense, instead of the strict nationalism that everybody, both the left and the right, wants to force you into which is what I don't believe in at, at all. Forgive me, but I'm not partial to flags or borders or countries, which I find to be a, a totally uh, 18th century construct, this question of nations, right? That was a big deal then. But nowadays with an international sort of society, uh, notice all these companies in Silicon Valley, they call themselves multinationals for a reason. They don't respect borders. They don't have borders, right? Their flag and, and their country is the almighty dollar. It's people like ourselves that are always told, oh no, you have to be a patriot of your country. You have to defend the borders of your country. You have to have, to have turf, like a gangbanger somewhere, you know? But the reality is, why? It is so passe, that concept of borders, right? Especially in the 21st century, we should all be able to cross the border in that sense. That would truly solve this problem of immigration, wouldn't it, Roxanne? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the European um, Union. Yeah, exactly. Such a positive. And you know, at one time there was the CARICOM, the Caribbean, Union that included uh, Guiana, Venezuela, you know, the surrounding, not just the islands. And that was Chetty Jagan and, you know, other Marxists who, who started that. And it was, of course, it was crushed by the United States. But so they're now all growing the same thing, you know, sugar, instead of uh, diversifying and exchanging with each other, you know. And the United States, a, a mentor of mine in Geneva at the UN, um, uh, Edith Ballantyne, um, she really nailed it at one time during the Southeast Asian, um, you know, the wars, um, the United States, that the United States is intent on breaking up any kind of regional, uh, regional unity, you know, um, and exchange to because capitalism you and corporatism wants to keep people separated from each other exactly uh, and we play right into that you know when we play nationalism and of course these white nationalists that exist uh, i you know growing up in rural oklahoma i've always known they're there and <laughs> some of my are my relatives 
and they, you know, but they were, they've been so empowered first by Reagan, people forget about that. Oh yeah, no. And, yeah, and now, you know, and then Trump, that they, they're really a force now yeah. to be reckoned with. Well, we, we have gone from being a nation of laws. No, notice nobody says that anymore, that we're a nation of laws. Now we're just a nation of scoundrels. Right. That's a good last word. <laughs> I think we'll end it right there, Alejandra. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you both so Holy very, God. very much. It has been such an honor and always a pleasure to host both of you. Thank everyone. Thank all of you for coming and uh, uh, friends and people I don't know personally. I really appreciate it. And I hope um, Definitely contact me if you have questions about the book. I'm easy to find. Uh, reddirtsite.com is my website. 